hour. Chciałabym przedstawić and may I introduce our guests, Mrs. Katarzyna Pełczyńska Nałęcz, former ambassador of the Republic of Poland to Russia, under Secretary of State in the Foreign Office. Uh, she specializes in Central or actually Eastern Europe, uh, used to work for the Center for Eastern Studies, currently in charge of the Open Europe uh, program at the Stefan Batari Foundation. Let us uh, welcome Katarzyna with applause. Mr. Andrei Kalesnikov, uh, head of uh, uh, head of uh, domestic politics and political institutions program at the Carnegie Center in Moscow, former editor of Novaya Gazeta in Izviestia, and uh, he he uh, wrote the um, biography of uh, Anatol Chubais. He publishes the Russian Forbes, uh, Gazeta uh, .ru, deputy editor-in-chief of Novaya Gazeta, and Mr. Andrzej Schnepper, uh, a diplomat and uh, an Iberian studies uh, specialist, uh, former, um, former ambassador and uh, former under Secretary of State uh, in the Foreign Office and the Office of the Prime Minister, and he was uh, he was an ambassador of uh, Poland uh, to such countries as Uruguay, Paraguay, Costa Rica, Spain, and the U.S. Before we start the discussion proper, may I ask Katarzyna Pełczyńska Nawęc to make an introduction to the broad topic of Russia its neighbors and Trump. Good morning, and thank you very much indeed. Can you hear me all right? I thank you very much for, for the invitation. <clears throat> when the unexpected to most result of uh, the election came to light in the US, Russia responded enthusiastically. And all the analysts and politicians who specialized in uh, diplomatic relations and political relations between uh, the US, uh, Russia, and Europe were deeply concerned in their reactions. What actually happened? was not exactly what had been expected. Nothing, the, the, what happened wasn't particularly positive, but Russia, Russia went through the curse of fulfilled dreams. It has been a dream for Russia, or in Russia, for quite a long time, ever since uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, or certainly at the time of Putin. The dream of Russia was to be recognized as the key powerful adversary of the United States. But it's not that Russia is the most important, but it hasn't left the headlines uh, of American newspapers for months. What are the gains for Russia from, from that, from a pragmatic Western perspective? These can be gains beyond comprehension, but important for Russia from the Russian perspective, and that is uh, the sense of satisfaction with having complicated the U.S. matters and with having um, made it, with having uh, positioned itself on the headlines. It also gives uh, Russia an excessive sense of uh, its own capacity and, and agency. So that is the gain for, for Moscow or for Kremlin, for the Kremlin, sorry. What did not happen was a personal arrangement, personal framework 
to dictate a geopolitical system. Russia thought it was desirable and plausible. This geopolitical arrangement was supposed to um, was to make uh, the influence of Russia in uh, the post-Soviet uh, er um, area and in the Baltics legitimate, and that would create a, a major crack in the transatlantic uh, system. That did not happen. Actually, something reverse uh, happened. The sanctions were reinforced, strengthened by, by extension, and by anchoring in the US uh, politics so strongly that one can hardly imagine its reversibility in the short uh, term, mm -hmm. which obviously has uh, contributed to a strengthened uh, pro-sanction position of the EU. The very idea that sanctions could be done away with uh, is economically very un, very non-viable, especially at the time where the U.S. is certainly sticking to to their sanction to the to the American sanctions policy. So Russia did not succeed on this front, and the U.S.-Russian relations are much worse than before Trump. Does it uh, mean that Trump's election has been um, an obstacle to realizing the strategic goals of Russia? Paradoxically not. Russia is probably not aware, fully aware, of how Trump's policies are in line, are aligned with the strategic goals of Russia. These strategic goals of Russia which have actually not been defined recently, but are long-lasting uh, goals ever since Russia came into being when it was reborn on the, on the ruins of Soviet Union. And they can be defined as follows. To dismantle the security uh, and political system and order in the West so that Russia moves out of the periphery to become one of the key decision makers and the Russian zone of influence is all, has always been part and parcel of uh, the Russian imagination uh, ar around the European and the transatlantic order. Stretching to stretch relations uh, with Europe uh, or Europe's transatlantic uh, relations, undermining, undermining uh, Europe's uh, leadership, uh, perceived leadership role, and Mr. Ambassador will add to this, to corrode uh, the American political system. Paradoxically, Trump and his presidency and things that uh, happened around is very much aligned with Russian, the Russian strategy. Although I believe Russia underestimates this and Russia does not fully grasp it. They hoped for a deal, but they are not seeing this corros corrosive process because they have, they have a, a, a wrong... Uh, um, understanding, incorrect understanding of the Western way of, 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 of seeing the world. They underestimate the values that underlie a transatlantic treaty and they do not believe this is not about cynical arrangements. So because they don't believe in values, they don't see this as an important development. This erosion is going on contrary to what Russia may be thinking. It extends, expands the crack between Europe and the US, still irreversible, um, 
but it is broadening. And this is uh, shaking up the European project. And the pendulum swings towards a position which is favorable to what Russia believes its goals are. This one, there's one more thing that hasn't happened under Trump, and Russia did expect that, and they were, and Russia was getting ready for that. A nuclear deal, a new deal on disarmament. This has not happened. This has not happened, I'm sorry, because of the escalation of mutual relations um, for a number of reasons, but mainly because of because of the Russian um, meddling uh, with European elections. Nonetheless, there is a potential conflict soaring over this. This is perhaps a topic that is not making to uh, the head making the headlines, but it's still quite a critical topic. It is not by accident that Russia has more and more often referred to nuclear issues in public uh, uh, public discourse. They are undermining uh, IMF. Um, they are doing this because the nuclear potential is the only platform where Russia is nearly on par with the US. Other platforms where Russia might prevail are not uh, relevant anymore. So why is Russia using this argument, nuclear argument, to force the US to continue discussions to um, to highlight its importance and to deal with what Russia is most concerned about. It's not the western, eastern uh, flank of the NATO or the US presence. It's the, uh, it's the missile defense system. This is the red line for Russia. Uh, Russia has not uh, conceded on this and how this is going to develop and how how will the uh, Trump administration response to the Russian yet uh, is hard to uh, project at the moment, is hard to foresee. But this is, uh, this is certainly an area where the transatlantic, um, uh, 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 transatlantic uh, system can move away from Russia even further. What does it mean for our neighbors our neighbors who are not neighbors of the US? Well, everyone has been afraid of, uh, of a deal that would render this part of Europe uh, part of uh, the Russian influence zone. This has not happened. This has not happened. Uh, any concession in Ukraine would have meant that, exactly that, and this has not happened. Uh, Russia wants to lead to a situation where this area, this, this most immediate neighborhood, and the, including countries that are geopolitically European, that's exactly the Eastern Partnership with Belarus, Moldova, uh, and uh, the Southern Caucasus countries. Now, these countries uh, should be dependent on Russia, should be made dependent on Russia uh, through the various interplay, uh, through the interplay of separatists, uh, separatist blackmail. Five countries have experienced that, and this scenario has played out. The only country where this has not been played out is Belarus. Why? The answer is kind of easy, and it's kind of easy to say this is, uh, this is a case 
where this scenario still may be played out. Therefore, Ukraine is really key. Ukraine is the only country in this constellation which has actively and effectively, although this mechanism has been installed, embedded in them, uh, has been uh, effective in gaining international, broad international support on the matter. From Trump's point of view, from his administration's point of view, there's only Ukraine in this area. The Caucasus, yes, it exists, but it has, uh, it has slided to the sidelines of uh, US priorities as it has uh, slided away from the top agenda of the of the uh, European Union. And then there's an unwritten um, arrangement where, which says that the transatlantic order of things d does not uh, apply to the Caucasus, to Moldova, to Belarus, and this veto has been made at the level of Ukraine. And this is not a politically correct a statement, but this is a, a realistic um, status, uh, status quo and, 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 and the, the state of play. Moldova has never been part of European, uh, sorry, of, of US agenda. Belarus had its uh, incidents. Uh, Belarus, Belarus is, uh, is about uh, a balanced agreement, everyone, Russia, the US, and the and, and Europe uh, are interested in maintaining the status quo in Belarus. But um, the vision of may happen after the status quo is totally different, and uh, Russia believes it should uh, it should make Belarus closer to Russia and uh, should be made more dependent. Uh, um, Europe uh, is thinking about this nebulous assimilation. Anyway, status quo is something people want because to shake this would mean problems. So everyone wants to temporarily maintain the status quo in um, in Belarus, and people are, you know, turning their eyes away from the country. And by the way, U.S. has never been has never been involved in the in uh, in, in Belarus uh, in the first place. So the whole thing of the common neighborhood of uh, Russia and Europe and Eastern uh, Europe is all about, all about Ukraine. What has happened on the Ukrainian front, if you like, uh, under Trump's presidency? At the level of diplomatic and political relations, if you look at the diplomatic calendar, Quite a large number of things have happened, quite a large number of positive have, have, have actually occurred. There have been high-level uh, visits from Ukraine to the US. There have been visits at a, at a senior level from the US to Ukraine. Um, a significant development, certainly not to be underestimated, uh, Kurt Volker has been appointed special U.S. envoy for Ukrainian affairs, and Kurt is, is going to be responsible for helping solve the Donbass conflict on the part of the U.S. He's appreciated, he's, uh, uh, he's a valued diplomat in, the, in, in Europe. He talks, he's talking to Russia, he's talking to the EU, that is this telephone number that you can always call and have a professional and in-depth discussion with the US partner. So this is something that must not be um, underestimated. That doesn't mean that Trump is very much focused on Ukraine. So I suppose the status of uh, the priority level of this issue is lower today than in Obama's times. I can 
I can repeat by uh, repeat what uh, Kurt Volker has said uh, firsthand about uh, Trump's attitude uh, to to Ukraine. I need a solution in Ukraine, not to make it an additional obstacle between Russia and the U.S. If you need anything, just do it. If you want to implement the, the uh, Minsk Accords, do it. If you need something else, just do it. I'm not, I don't care. Here's your job, do it. There's no deep understanding, there's no, uh, there's no awareness of how unsolvable this conflict is in the short term or medium, medium term. That's the president. Obviously, Kurt, uh, Kurt Volker has an in-depth understanding of uh, the intricacy of the situation. Paradoxically, even though much has happened, there have been um, a plea, a proposal, not followed up by action, but there's a plea, there's a, a declaration that non-lethal weapons be delivered to Ukraine. This has not come to fruition. Nonetheless, if the president uh, of the U.S. of U.S. of the U.S. is making this point, it's 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 critical in itself. And then Russia responded with the UN uh, peace uh, peace mission in the conflict area. Now, all these things preoccup have preoccupied mm -hmm. uh, diplomats, and they these all these things have been seriously negotiated by all those diplomats who have focused on U on the Ukrainian conflict. Plus. There is an ongoing and permanent process of putting the Minsk Accords into practice. Now, this all this has been happening, but the parameters of the conflict itself have not changed an inch to my mind. What are the parameters? There is an interest of Russia. Russia has a vested interest in legitimizing its political presence in Ukraine. This is the ultimate Russian interest, and Minsk Accords are supposed to, to do that. And there's a suggestion that the Constitution be amended, and, 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 and that is the pursuit of, uh, of uh, Russian interest. Now, the vested interest of Ukraine is to minimize internal politic, political uh, uh, tension as a result of uh, the Donbass conflict. And it's not, you know, as st strange as it may sound, it's not to neutralize Russian interventionism, it's not to uh, stabilize the country or re re reunite the country. It's, it's not even about the Minsk Accords. It's something else. And this is the, I'm, I'm talking about this practical uh, view of, uh, of Ukrainian politicians, they want, they don't want the, um, the situation to mm. topple the current Ukrainian leadership. And there's, a, there's logic to it, and you shouldn't easily criticize this. They have, they pursue uh, the logic that any shakeup in the leadership would mean that uh, it would not be possible to defend against the Russian uh, goal number one, <clears throat> and that would mean Minsk uh, Accords uh, would not be implemented. There's no way Russia can agree under U.S. Uh, US yeah. uh, pressure. There's no way Russia can agree to uh, Russia failing to win in the elections in the territories they occupy. That would be unacceptable, unacceptable uh, for Putin. That means that no democratic elections can happen there. Elections that have a predefined result are the only option. So the, 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 the whole Minsk domino uh, effect cannot really be triggered. So that means uh, the situation is a bit frozen. 
it actually didn't start under Trump, but it has reinforced, been reinforced under Trump, and it will survive Trump. The role of the U.S. in this situation, in light of vis-à-vis uh, -vis the Ukraine, boils down to two items. First of all, to maintain the sanctions and to uh, ensure a guarantee uh, that uh, this uh, sanction regime is uh, maintained also for the European Union. And the second is to possibly respond to any military escalation. Should there be a military escalation, then the US and the role of the US within this conflict would have radically um, escalated. Um, so today, I would uh, make the, um, or put forward the thesis that um, on the Russian part, uh, there's no such uh, calculation that uh, the uh, conflict in the uh, Ukraine should be escalated in military terms. And I'm not here speaking about uh, the conflict between um, the uh, European Union and Russia, or Russia and the US, but uh, within Russia, any escalation in the Ukraine is uh, uns cannot be resolved, in, in, and it will lead to, to an internal uh, Russian uh, conflict and will have to sort of deter attention to some external location. And since this is not happening, and I don't believe it's happening, so in this sense, um, uh, this conflict uh, can be quite uh, safe in terms of uh, uh, non-escalation. So the American role uh, really boils down uh, to take part in this process uh, with uh, the Minsk Accords and uh, the UN. And the uh, US are part of uh, the UN peace mission, but they're just part of the process, not a component uh, that could really change uh, this uh, process and to um, uh, create some qualitative improvement. The US role is really to maintain and to preserve the sanctions, and they're performing that role. Everything else, uh, this uh, strategic long-term uh, issue uh, with respect to, to uh, the Russian intervention in Ukraine, uh, the so-called half-frozen conflict, uh, the um, order of uh, safety and security is really in now a transfer to the European Union, and the European Union needs to resolve this, or the European Union will have to consume the consequences that um, are the outcome of the situation. And now to conclude, I know that my time is running out. A lot will really depend on how the EU responds, but even more will be contingent, and I'm sorry for speaking in such blunt terms. In other words, what the European Union does uh, about itself, and I think we'll be speaking about and that uh, during the next session. So I would like to conclude with this uh, comment. So I'd like to thank you very much. Uh, all those comments uh, with uh, respect uh, to international security and the situation of the Ukraine will be very useful in the coming moments. Uh, but before we do that, uh, I'd like to respond to what you said at the very beginning of your intervention and open this to discussion and ask all of you really to respond uh, to this. Namely, um, uh, you had mentioned at the very beginning in, in a very interesting way um, and you raise the argument that the Trump presidency, the Trump administration, fulfills the strategic goals of Russia uh, in a geopolitical sense. But if I understood you correctly, uh, that Russia does not uh, recognize or doesn't understand uh, the system of values on which the Euro-Atlantic order is uh, um, anchored. And uh, really, uh, could we sort of discuss with this statement? Uh, because for, I always thought uh, that Russia possibly fails uh, to understand this order of values, or that Russia believes that it's insignificant. Um, I do, however, felt that Russia did recognize that this order is uh, described and debated and, or maybe the best word would be that it's a declared set of values. 
and uh, that uh, sometimes they parody this uh, or, or troll uh, this uh, Western order of values. Um, speaking about a situation, you organize a, a stability mission to the Middle East. Okay, we'll par parody this uh, in Syria. And you're providing humanitarian aid. Oh, okay, fine. We will now provide humanitarian aid uh, to Donbas. I spoke to Lilia Shevtsova, <coughs> who makes a different claim than most analysts. Namely, she said that in Russia, nobody wanted Trump. They wanted uh, this situation uh, to, or this election situation to be very heated and to have Russia perceived as a um, um, sort of uh, factor that could sort of stir things up. Uh, but um, it's easier to create a position in Russia if you have a predictable opponent or adversary. Um, opponent or adversary where you know what to expect. So what do you, how would you respond to this statement? Who would like to respond? Um, good morning, and I'd like to thank you, first of all, for the invitation. Uh, debating in uh, this uh, group is an honor. Now, I'd like to rather speak about uh, the U.S. perspective. In my left uh, visit to uh, Russia had been a long, long time ago, and I do feel that uh, without feeling the spirit of the street, so to say, I'm really not uh, capable to intellectually consume what uh, the possibly uh, the um, uh, uh, citizens of the Russian Federation could be thinking, to say nothing about what uh, the leadership of that country is thinking, though of course I did ha have a context with uh, Russian representatives, uh, predominantly in Washington. But I'd like to really respond by saying how this was played out in the US. I, in fact, uh, subscribe to what Madam Ambassador said in terms of the main thesis. I could actually even supplement uh, some uh, further issues. but. Uh, Madam Ambassador, uh, you said that we can uh, take uh, the liberty of a sort of political incorrectness uh, because Donald Trump really encouraged us to act in that manner. So let's start from the beginning and let's start with something that is um, sort of a reoccurring theme in our debates and discussions and is also part of uh, the uh, political um, uh, measures, not only in the US uh, but also in the, our part of the world. There is a reset. Uh, when in the horizon there was the perspective of in, in, uh, Medvedev uh, uh, becoming president, according to uh, the um, estimates of U.S. experts, but also American intelligence, it created a certain opportunity of uh, uh, arranging uh, the relations somewhat differently. Uh, other European countries followed suit, including Poland, because this is a component of a controversy that is a reoccurring controversy. So I do believe that it's worth saying a few things that are politically incorrect. Uh, I do believe uh, it would be a very strongly anchored uh, in the role of every diplomatist to put such a situation to a test. To leave this new leadership, uh, it seemed at that time, be it in Russia or in some other areas. I could also, for example, mention other countries like Cuba, where Fidel Castro was leaving and Raul um, uh, was taking, assuming, should we put our trust and should we uh, believe that he could uh, engender change in, in the uh, domestic policies and uh, the relations with the rest of the democratic world. And failure to give that a uh, chance, uh, this means that we remain, uh, uh, as an unknown, uh, a very serious or uh, uh, important opportunity uh, to um, improve the situation in the world, uh, to reduce uh, the areas of conflict and to um, allow uh, the uh, foreign policy to um, 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 be uh, on a more safe track. Uh, we know that this was an error because uh, the assessment of experts and uh, intelligence services as to the influence that Medvedev might have on uh, U.S. policies. What is the real and practical uh, uh, order of power in the Kremlin was not 
effectively and uh, thoroughly identified. And in a way, we fell victim to certain errors and mistakes that have been made. But those mistakes are a natural consequence, if I can repeat myself, a natural consequence to try uh, to uh, um, push the world out of an area of conflict. And this would be a natural response whenever in China or some other country there is this assumption that uh, the new leadership uh, um, could might uh, um, um, create some uh, evolution. I spoke uh, to uh, the authors of the US Reset who claimed, yes, we had erred, we had made a mistake. And uh, America will not repeat that uh, mistake uh, um, soon. When Donald Trump uh, uh, won the elections, and uh, we knew oh, how that panned out, and we do know that it's the US system, and I don't want to really reopen this topic, but it's the US system that uh, creates a certain specific um, situation of how the ballot is counted. And, and to, we were all convinced, I, myself included, uh, that this propensity, this willingness uh, to establish relations with the Russian Federation at a different level, in this positive spirit of change uh, that Donald Trump had announced, on the eve, it's, uh, that uh, for our region this could uh, mean that we would be um, Possibly not disregarding, but we will be overlooking uh, the uh, superpowers. Um, uh, uh, well, but already um, January uh, 2017, um, uh, just well, under a year ago, we uh, learned from the New York Times first, and then from also other uh, uh, media reports, uh, something that was uh, then um, and described as uh, the Russian cloud over the US elections. Uh, the role uh, of this uh, uh, um, short term of uh, General Flynn um, and uh, other uh, engagement and contacts and that were pursued by uh, the Trump team during the election campaign. Ask about this on numerous occasions, I responded by saying that even if Donald Trump uh, wants to completely revolutionize uh, the relationships uh, between Russia and the US, he will have one major problem, namely uh, the US people, but also the US Congress. They're simply not prepared, uh, not prepared uh, even emotionally. Uh, to uh, accept that a country that in the U.S. is associated as a um, uh, hard and ruthless at times rival now uh, becomes a um, partner uh, in resolving uh, the uh, most important global problems, uh, while uh, those problems, apart from the Ukraine, uh, uh, are really outside our experience, um, because it's Iran, uh, the Middle East, Syria, and Korea, North Korea. So everybody has uh, the illusion that Ukraine is number one. Well, it's only within this group, uh, um, because in the US administration, um, and those visits that Madam Ambassador uh, referred to, and certain promises that had been made in terms of equipping uh, the um, armed forces of Ukraine. And uh, so this only exists uh, uh, just to uh, uh, ensure that all those um, suspicions uh, uh, with respect to the US are false. And uh, the outcome of uh, the uh, political by the political enemies of the president himself. However, the problem is that Donald Trump has a strong opposition within Congress itself, and not only from uh, the Democratic Party but also from the Republicans. And it's, I think, a point of interest uh, that the function of uh, the envoy. Uh, in the so-called uh, Ukrainian envoy, uh, it was entrusted uh, to um, a renowned uh, diplomat, uh, uh, Kurt Volker, who's very knowledgeable about Ukraine, who formerly had been the director of the McCain Institute. Uh, McCain, Senator McCain, is a great opponent of uh, Trump and a 
tough player in terms of relationships with Russia. And the same is interesting uh, the position of the Assistant Secretary of State uh, to Wes Mitchell, also a um, um, person with great professional knowledge, uh, former director of the uh, SIPA think tank. Uh, a conservatist, but who's uh, knowledgeable about uh, this uh, um, area and is determined uh, to preserve uh, the culture of the West and democratic values in Central and Eastern Europe. And I think that this demonstrates that Donald Trump um, had to show uh, to the U.S. Congress. Uh, the U.S. Congress follows all this information, but also to demonstrate to the general public that Russia is still not only a competitor, but actually an opponent of uh, the U.S. in uh, the um, uh, stabilizing the process of stabilizing uh, the democratic world. And all these plans that, without a doubt, had existed in the past, uh, had uh, fallen to um, rubble because uh, the domestic situation, which uh, um, um, uh, determines most of the measures taken by the U.S. administration, is to flex the muscles, is to uh, make certain gestures, uh, symbolic gestures, um, that is, vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. embassy, uh, measures taken by the U.S. Uh, services vis-à-vis uh, -vis Russia. All of this in order to show uh, that this uh, um, um, loop of uh, charges has not uh, um, evaporated. If we look at this from the Warsaw perspective, we might say, okay, the, this is something that is just a, um, a history. Um, but this is not the case under the domestic U.S. market. If you follow the U.S. media reports, you do know that apart from contacts of the immediate family of uh, Trump, which have been um, uh, showcased, and, and this was really bad because uh, for um, uh, uh, revealing the whole dirt about uh, Hillary Clinton, we, uh, so apart from that, we also have um, uh, the uh, actions of uh, the um, Robert Miller, uh, special prosecutor, who is uh, uh, working on revealing and charging um, persons who had uh, uh, fostered uh, uh, Russian uh, meddling in the election process. Charges have already been made, and the penalty um, is even up to 30 years uh, prison sentence. And so um, one has already sort of uh, begun to spill, if I can use this colloquial term. In other words, for the promise of uh, cooperating with uh, the um, uh, services and um, he will uh, reveal all the details of contacts from 2015 and 2016. And if this is compounded, and I'll be brief now, and if this is compounded uh, by uh, this uh, horrific uh, issue that, and we actually spoke among each other saying that the third war has already begun because we said that uh, the um, uh, social media and in the U.S., um, uh, the biggest uh, companies, in Google, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and Messenger, and some others, um, are being questioned and uh, for a very uh, silly money, about 160,000 U.S. dollars, placed ads which, according uh, to uh, calculations made today, had been uh, seen by at least 180 million people. And these are not ads that you can imagine well as in the time of the Soviet Union uh, where the, Russia is right. Uh, ads, what you would say. You need to be afraid of American nuclear um, power. No, no, this type of ads were uh, uh, very subtle and uh, uh, in, to address uh, the average American 
and which, for example, had shown a young woman in a hijab uh, who said, thank you, Hillary, for uh, taking such good care of us. And this was, of course, um, um, displayed during uh, the U.S. election campaign. It's a whole, whole mass of ads which support something uh, which and that Black Lives Matters. The life of a black uh, uh, person is the same value as any other life. So the message itself, uh, uh, of course, is not controversial. However, in a very obvious way, uh, it is a source of inspiration for various milieus, for various communities, uh, the Afro-American uh, communities, but even more so. Um, the American supremacist, white nationalist, uh, who uh, then uh, um, carry out events at Charlottesville or Gainesville, where at the university where were clashes, after statements uh, that have uh, been made by uh, some of the white supremacists. So this is really um, uh, undermining the principles uh, that uh, Madam Ambassador spoke about, the foundations of Western civilizations. And uh, America still feels um, in, uh, the uh, custodian of those values. Um, the um, average American will say, yes, America is the most democratic country in the world. Everybody wants to subscribe and believe in that. That propaganda, uh, this gigantic uh, campaign that was uh, carried out in the US, vis-a-vis -vis US citizens, predominantly US citizens, most probably had, had a very strong impact. Uh, the uh, Committee on Security and Special Services of the Senate, of the U.S. Senate, had actually um, carried out hearings um, uh, uh, to all those media, of all those media corporations. Uh, why have they not actually eliminated uh, such uh, ads? And why uh, had this sort of uh, third? a war of uh, the internet been waged uh, without having to enter a country physically in heavy boots. So what are the prospects? Well, the prospects I think that we will see, and will of course possibly need to wait another six months, and uh, that is uh, to uh, the midterm elections in the US. And it's obvious uh, that the Republican candidates uh, would not uh, be able to um, be more critical vis-a-vis uh, -vis their own president because uh, possibly uh, that would uh, uh, make a victory in those uh, midterm elections impossible for them. But at the end of next year, we can expect uh, serious charges that will be uh, coming out of the entire investigation process, but also determination on the part of the investigative uh, committees in the Senate and in uh, the House uh, will be uh, dealing uh, with Russian meddling in a very serious manner, because this is something that will go on. If Donald Trump uh, comes out of this uh, sort of uh, uh, cleaned, because Questioning uh, the authority of the president of the U.S. is a tragedy, and it will be also a tragedy for the Polish interests. And I'm um, here thinking not about Trump, but any U.S. president. But if he is got clear, if he's cleared out of this, uh, he will then be able to take on board the plans that he had been speaking about in the election campaign, that the world needs to be rearranged, because this is the mentality of a business person who I believe still believes that uh, politics can be carried out via Twitter, and negotiations are done over a table. I'll give you this, and uh, you give me that. Uh, for uh, one a container of sugar, uh, we will give you something else, uh, the deal is done, and we shake hands. But we all know that the world is more complicated than that. The day before yesterday, Business Insider published an article about two pro, two um, protests, pro and anti-Muslim pr protests in Houston. Apparently, according to Business Insider, both were fueled and orchestrated by Russia. This is a hot topic. I'd like to revisit it and. Um, Thank you very much for bullet pointing the aspects of the US um, politics. 
before we get back to the Russian trails in the elections or the day-to-day -day life in the US, I would like to ask Mr. Kolesnikov for his perspective on the Russian Russian views of the world after Trump. Did they want Trump? Do they still want Trump? And probably uh, they did want. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Yeah. I understand everything, but I will rather speak in English. It'll be easier for me. Um, I can suggest a little bit another angle uh, to, to, to this talk. Uh, because uh, this is not only the problem of uh, Trump or uh, relations between, between Russia and the United States. This is a problem of the whole world. Uh, I can name it uh, the problem of um, voter against institutions and uh, universal values uh, of the Western civilization. Uh, we can witness uh, different processes in Poland, in uh, Hungary, in the uh, Czech Republic, uh, in Slovak Republic, in uh, Austria, everywhere. Uh, everything is changing all the time. Uh, this is a time of permanent changes, of changes, of changes, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is a time of uh, the disappearance of uh, uh, political parties in, in the classic sense of the, world, of the word. And this is a problem of um, destruction of um, institutions, uh, of the European institutions, so, and so on and so forth. I've just arrived from Sofia, from a very small seminar with the participation of uh, Ivan Krastev, who was an author of uh, the epigraph to this conference uh, that, uh, that uh, we, we, we have lost, uh, Putin uh, have lost uh, a monopoly on, on unpredictability with the appearance of uh, Trump. Uh, but uh, right now for Russians, uh, Trump is a uh, so played out person because uh, there were a lot of hopes uh, in our state Duma, in our parliament, uh, deputies uh, uncorked champagne when uh, he was a winner several months ago and uh, the disillusion is uh, such a huge uh, that uh, there are no hopes with um, Trump right, right now. Uh, but again, uh, this is more philosophical approach to, to, to this problem because uh, Putin thought, Putin and his inner circle, they thought that uh, uh, Trump could be ours, so to say, just like Krim Nash, uh, Trump Nash. Uh, and this concept failed totally. And because of that, uh, Putin and his inner circle, they returned uh, to another concept, the concept of besieged fortress, which is actionable, workable until now. Uh, uh, the West is attacking us. Uh, we are defending our borders uh, in uh, not only in, in terms of warfare, but in terms of information warfare, hybrid war, and so on and so forth. And uh, the majority of Russians uh, is ready to consolidate around Putin uh, in this atmosphere of the permanent attack. But the hopes were another, because uh, which was the concept, uh, we will uh, articulate a uh, new policy towards the West on our own terms. In a case of the victory of Trump, in a case of uh, the victory of Marine Le Pen, in a case of the victory of uh, ultra-rightists in, in, in the main European and uh, Western countries. Uh, and I believe that Putin sincerely thought that he can split uh, Europe. Uh, returning, uh, that he can return to uh, the concept of uh, zones of influence. Uh, to the concept of uh, 19th and 20th, 20th centuries. Uh, not too modern, but uh, workable for him. Uh, he failed a little bit uh, with Marine Le Pen, with Le Trump. Trump, uh, uh, Trump uh, failed in his struggle with, uh, with American democracy. It found out that American democracy exists, that its institutions uh, are working, 
uh, I would say that even in uh, Europe, uh, it found out that European democracy is existing until now. And um, if we are talking all the time about uh, the wave of populism, we must talk about uh, the wave of counter-populism in nearly all the countries, uh, and uh, in Poland as well, as I can see. Uh, so uh, we must understand that uh, these institutions are workable and these values are struggling with, with so to say, new va values which are old ones in, in reality, but uh, more or less successfully until now. Nobody can predict what will be tomorrow, but uh, right now we, we are witnessing this, uh, this struggle, this confrontation. So returning to, to, to Putin and his attitudes uh, to, to the West, so this uh, new approach uh, with uh, the goal to split the Western world uh, failed. Uh, and he returned to the concept of uh, besiegers of fortress, uh, and he's uh, using this concept right now during his, his own presidential campaign, which wasn't announced officially, but uh, Putin is uh, providing his own campaign since August 1999, since his first day at the position of the uh, acting uh, Prime Minister of the Russian Federation. Every day in his life is a uh, presidential campaign. Uh, and it will be for, for years, uh, I'm sure. Um, so he's using uh, this concept, uh, nothing new. This is routine concept. Uh, it's, it is actionable, workable. And the culmination of uh, his foreign policy and domestic policy at the same, at the same time was uh, the annexation of Crimea, uh, which was at the same time the boost in his popularity. He needs, uh, he needs a stance of permanent warfare, hybrid warfare, in order to maintain the level of support uh, of the majority of Russians. Uh, we can say that emotionally, uh, this concept of defending uh, could be uh, depleted or, um, or played out, but at the same time, uh, it works until now. Um, I can suggest you several figures. Uh, one of the most stable figures, uh, sociological figures, I mean, is not only uh, the rate of approval of the activity of the president, 80% something, but uh, uh, the rate of um, approving uh, uh, the policy of uh, isolationism, 70% of respondents are saying that we must continue our political, our own political route despite, despite of the sanctions. This is one of the most stable figures, just like the figures of uh, support of the annexation of Crimea. Around uh, around 80 percent, and uh, what about attitudes uh, toward the West? Uh, when uh, Putin made some hints uh, that we can be the main uh, site which can articulate the rules for the world, uh, and when Trump was victorious, uh, the attitudes towards the USA became much better than it was in in, in previous years, uh, nearly friendly. Uh, and it's very interesting to observe the dynamics of uh, these attitudes in the year uh, 2017, in this year. In January, uh, the bad attitudes, negative attitudes towards uh, the USA was at the level of uh, 49%. In March of this year, 42%. Uh, in the end of uh, the summer, uh, 61 percent. Steadily, slowly, but steadily, these attitudes, negative attitudes to, towards uh, the USA are returning. The same thing with, uh, with the European Union right now, the negative attitude is uh, 55 percent. Uh, comparing with Ukraine, 59 percent. Ukraine right now, this is uh, in, in, in Russian minds, this is enemy in the proper sense of the word. Uh, I can't remember right now the current figures um, concerning Poland, but uh, in, in, in the year 2016, Poland was the fourth, fourth, fourth country which, which were 
most hatred among among other countries, comparing with the USA, Ukraine, and um, I can't remember what was the third one. Uh, maybe it is a little bit better right now, but uh, it it means nothing absolutely because uh, Poland is not in focus of uh, attention of uh, Russians right now. Uh, this is country which is uh, the permanent member, so to say, of the axis of evil in Russian eyes, through the Russian lens, just like Georgia, just like Baltic states, uh, just like USA, uh, Ukraine. So this is a little bit historical matter, past dependence in this attitude, but at the same time, this is kind of a, kind of a, I don't know, the signs of um, a lack of any attitude towards Poland. Yes, Poland is hostile toward us, so we will be hostile toward Poland. Why? Nobody knows. Uh, so, uh, at this point we are returning to this uh, previous concept of uh, the besieged fortress. It will work during the presidential campaign uh, with the main focus on uh, uh, domestic agenda, especially economic agenda, because uh, yes, uh, when we are convening focus groups uh, with Levada Center, we are making it from time to time, we can see uh, that uh, people uh, express uh, content with uh, the current situation uh, in, so to say, external fields. Uh, we returned our pride, we returned our mighty, we are uh, providing warfare in distant territories, we are successful in, in Syria, just like Soviet Union, we are great. So this is a full stop in that sense. But guys, let's let's concentrate on something else, on, on, on economy matters, on the matters of uh, social uh, performance, better performance in social politics. Uh, it means that nobody's ready in Russia right now for any kind of revolutions against Putin. Putin is a supported person because of this recreating of the sense of uh, the sense of a great power. But at the same time, one of the qualities of this great power is uh, good economic performance. It's again according to the sociological uh, polls. And uh, Putin will have to concentrate on uh, domestic economic agenda. Uh, I can say that even Ukraine right now is not in, 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 in his focus. Uh, Trump is not in, in, in his focus right now. Uh, so Russia made its best. So why are waiting from the West some suggestions to improve the situation? Uh, some suggestions, friendly steps, not, not more. We will make any steps because we, we made it. We are ready to cooperate on different issues. So lift the sanctions, okay? We will lift country sanctions. This is liberal principles of free trade. And by the way, uh, uh, despite of the sanctions, uh, according to the state statistics, Europe is until now the main trade partner of uh, Russia, 43% the share of uh, trade, comparing with China, something like 15% after the boost uh, in, in trade relations with China. So uh, this is a point of, uh, I would say, pause in the relations between uh, Russia uh, in the West, and uh, everything is possible. But again, do not wait uh, principal changes in the position of uh, Russian elites uh, in, in all spheres, in the sphere of foreign policy, in the sphere of domestic policy as well. Uh, to say, and I'm talking about uh, the government, to, to say that uh, Poland is skeptical about Russia is to say very little. And there is, there is a bit of uh, fear mixed with derision. But I suppose this is something that is present in other countries. Mr. Schnepf uh, has alluded to other cases where there are serious indications that Russia has meddled in their internal politics. Having said that, I'm wondering, 
Maybe we are starting to panic, be it in the US or Europe. We have other reasons for right-wing populism to be on the rise. Surely Putin may be uh, helping the process, but it might, uh, he might not be the root cause. Maybe we are overreacting, maybe we are panicking, making Putin the right-wing Shorosh, where we see Putin everywhere, where the right-wing sees Soros and, and his tentacles. There is absolutely no doubt that for many, many politicians in the US and politicians here, if Putin didn't exist, he would have to be invented. He is a very relevant or very needed, if you like, uh, way of uh, explaining certain phenomena, whether Russia actually supports them or not. There's absolutely no doubt that uh, that there's been a, 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 a crawling crisis ever since uh, the 1970s in the United States, the deteriorating middle class and the closure of old uh, factories and uh, the closure of industries that have been relocated to cheaper and more productive uh, places, more economically productive. A large part of white, white America voted the way they voted because they have had this um, this yearning for the world Trump appears to portray the US of the 1960s 60s where the US was the most civilized and progressive countries which it no longer is most Americans have uh, washing machines and blenders and color TV. In Europe, many, many citizens have, hadn't actually heard about these things, or they saw these things in US movies. I remember this family I met in Madrid. Uh, let, me, let me use this as a, as a case study. They returned from Venezuela in uh, 58 after the coup d'etat. And they had made lots of money there. And this lady, an elderly lady today, said she told me that when they came to Spain in 57, and Spain wasn't that affluent, they, they actually saw that their country, there were, there were Spaniards. Their country lives in Middle Ages compared to Venezuelan elite which obviously borrowed a lot of, uh, you know, gadgets uh, from the U.S. They, they brought all the television sets and the hair dryers and, and the washing machines. And in Madrid, they learned that most of the city still called the food using ice brought by carts um, and the, the ice was put in the, in the cupboard, and this was the fridge. The yearning for Americans, uh, yearning of Americans for the 1960s, where they prevailed everywhere, in nuclear, in arms. They dictated uh, the terms and conditions to half of the world. That was the politics of, of, uh, of the day. Central America, Latin America, and the hard fist of the U.S., and that's the part of the U.S. society which, uh, which says, well, we're not racist, but we want uh, blacks to have their own, to understand their own position. So this yearning was somewhere at the back of people's minds or, or behind the elections. And you're right. These problems in the U.S., in Europe, in Poland, in Hungary, they exist objectively, they have existed objectively as a result of accumulation of wealth and OECD statistics are very brutal. 
um, in the US, even more so, where the accumulation of wealth is, is cosmic, is, cr is crazy, and um, there's, no, there's no solution, and people have not been reached out, people have been reached out but by the populists. And this is where people, this is where people see, see consolation. And by the way, Putin's administration is well organized. Actually, at a time of crisis, totalitarian regimes do better because you don't have to consult anything. You don't have to have committees and meetings. It's a will of one person. So it's effective. It's, the politics is faster and more disciplined. Russian diplomacy, Russian um, civil servants are very, very uh, well disciplined because they implement the will of uh, Vladimir Putin and he managed the country effectively. And I suppose the Russian citizens appreciate that as, as uh, uh, voters in any other country uh, would appreciate someone who uh, says that uh, whatever he will do, will do, and he delivers, whether it's legal or not. Poland, <laughs> in the proper sense of the word, of the word, because uh, there is no economic resources for it. Uh, even in uh, the future federal budget, we have uh, several cuts, not only in different expenditures, but in military expenditures as well. This is uh, an economic and uh, political. Uh, reason not to attack any, anyone, uh, Finland, Baltic states, Poland, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, uh, very important uh, political uh, or philosophical uh, reason, uh, this is not Russian world. If Putin is trying to recreate, in some sense, imaginary empire, and his thinking is imperialistic, uh, it means uh, that he's, he recreated it right now, uh, seizuring Crimea, he doesn't, he doesn't need uh, even uh, Eastern Ukraine in that sense, because Russian, uh, the borders of Russian world are, uh, are at the east from, from, from the Polish uh, borders right now. And uh, Poland uh, can be included into this imaginary empire, just like Baltic states. So it's impossible to, to initiate real confrontation with uh, the Eastern Europe, I think, for Putin. Chciałam jeszcze na koniec zapytać pana Kolesnikowa, jakie błędy najczęściej popełniają zachodnie... I would like to ask Mr. Kolesnikow about the usual mistakes made by Western, Western uh, analysts so that we don't have... Uh, whether we don't do the mistakes, but we don't have uh, the time. We are left with just uh, 10 minutes. So let's use it for questions. Jacek Potocki, Secretary of International Columnists Association. I liked what Ambassador Schnepf uh, said about uh, US uh, values, and I liked uh, Madam Ambassador's uh, points. But uh, let me say that Russia understands uh, the values of America. It's just they have good analysts, but they do not share the values. They are not their values. They disagree. And secondly, I believe Russia is playing to split the NATO. Look at what's going on in Turkey. Turkey, a pillar of the NATO, the second biggest army, they are buying weapons from Russia. What do you think about this? Richard Bobrowski, uh, Przegląd uh, Środkowy Europejski. I have a question to Mr. Ambassador as, a, as an expert on American politics because you've had first-hand experience. In, 20, in 2018, Trump uh, may be either impeached or, or not, uh, may, may be in trouble. Let me assume that he will be cleaned up and that he would be given the chance to uh, pursue his policies. Uh, what 
What will the politics policies be, business as usual? Will it be close proximity to Russia against uh, China or any other policy that you might, uh, might envisage? And the second question is to Mr. Kolesnikov. You said that Western sanctions have not prevented uh, a large volume of trade between Russia and Europe. Why this noise then? What is the realistic impact of the sanctions on Putin's policy? What is uh, the meaning of the sanctions in the first place? Slavomir Sherakovsky, the host organization, the Institute of Advanced Studies, and I have a several I have a several questions. Maybe there will be enough time or not for answering I have a question to Ambassador Schnepf. Do you believe that once the investigation is over, I mean the investigation on Russian meddling, will uh, the US try to deal with the problem um, seeking justice from Russia? I would like to ask Mr. Kolesnikov. Do you believe that uh, Russia is now thinking that this was a wrong idea I'm, I'm in the context of this investigation in the US? The very fact that, that we have Trump in the, in the office, not Hillary, is, is a gain. Do Russians think it's a, it's a gain in itself? Even though Donald Trump has been lost as a as a uh, as a friend of Russia because he's been he's fallen into the hands of Republican hawks. So is is it a total failure? And would Russia do this again if the opportunity arose? Thirdly. How much does Ukraine want to implement the Minsk Accords itself? That's a question to Madam Ambassador. So, Mr. Schnepp, perhaps? No. If I could respond to both questions. Uh, there is the prospects of 2018, the um, midterm elections, in the middle of the um, Trump administration and the prospects of EU, uh, US policies. If uh, Donald Trump is cleared of the charges, and that is possible, uh, that others will be sentenced, and there will be uh, those who will be sentenced, I have no doubts that they will be charged and sentenced. Uh, Paul Manafort, uh, the first head of uh, the campaign, um, the charges are very serious against him. Paul Manafort uh, agreed to cooperate? No, no. Uh, Mr. Patapoulos, for the time being, has uh, uh, agreed to cooperate. Um, those other guys will be put on the um, uh, back burner to show them what the prospects for them are, and I think they will. Uh, uh, be uh, willing to cooperate for the time being. They're uh, claiming uh, to not remember. But one, as I said, has already agreed to cooperate, uh, hoping that uh, this will lead to a lighter sentence. Uh, the role of Russia or the um, policies of Russia in this interim until autumn of next year will be to um, keep things uncertain. Nothing can be done without Russia, so to say. Uh, sort of freezing the uh, controversies vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis or, or over um, Syria. Uh, this uh, um, uh, undertaking initiatives that the other side needs to respond to, uh, contacts with Iran and Turkey which uh, Jacek had referred to. So, and North Korea, uh, um, just to demonstrate that without Russia, none of these problems can be resolved. I really do not have doubts that if Donald Trump uh, is stays in, in the office, 
and the U.S. Congress will have been changed uh, as the result of the midterm elections. Um, uh, two uh, important senators, uh, Mr. Corker and Flake, have both Republicans have already entered on the war path with Trump and have uh, declined from uh, running in the upcoming elections. So this Congress could be a different Congress after the elections, more supportive to Trump if Trump wins this domestic, let's say, uh, uh, clash. And then the concept of cooperation with Russia will be revisited because Donald Trump needs success on the domestic market if he wants to uh, run for the next um, uh, term. Uh, he entrusted to, to his um, son-in-law an unresolvable problem, uh, that is uh, the relations in the Middle East between Israel and Arab countries. He entrusted this to his son-in-law, and not because he wants this to be lost, but because he wants to see victory. Because uh, Donald Trump uh, places highest value on his members of the family, and Jared Kushner needs to um, demonstrate some success. Donald Trump has to have some success in Korea. He has to have some success in Iran, because without without cooperation with Russia, because Russia will, of course, continue to demonstrate that there can be no other possibility than to cooperate with Russia. So to, if this happens, uh, clearing the field, so to say, Donald Trump will then take on board this uh, challenge. And uh, what will happen is something that we were concerned before uh, uh, the inauguration of a Trump presidency. And it seems that we are writing this uh, card, which is called the worst it is, the better. Uh, Turkey, uh, and let me just add to this, uh, Turkey is a serious problem. And this is um, part and parcel of the Turkish aspiration. Erdogan, President Erdogan, is really um, far uh, uh, removed from implementing uh, the vision of a democratic state. And we all know this, even in the um, uh, 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 situation, the upturn, uh, um, and I was following this uh, online from Washington, and all of this really poses many questions. How this happened? Who had truly inspired um, uh, this uh, attempt to topple the government? If you saw uh, the um, situation on the bridge, uh, the way uh, the army responded uh, to the people, and I think this all creates an um, uh, impression that this is not some uh, uh, upheaval created by an uh, old guy living in the US. Somebody, of course, had to be blamed, but this is a really a big trump card in, in the hands of Putin and uh, this decision to buy weapons, to buy arms, uh, well, this is just to show who really holds the trump cards. We'll need to be uh, run, uh, concluding, uh, so could you please respond briefly, Mr. Kolesnikov? Uh, Putin doesn't have... Uh uh, Putin has very good relations, personal relations with the same Erdogan, but at the same time we are providing permanent tomato war, so-called tomato war, trade war with, with Turkey. It means that relations between autocrats uh, always are quite bad. And this is one more reason not to construct friendly rela relations between Putin and Kaczynski, I think. So I'm not meddling into the Polish situation. <laughs> so, uh, well, well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. Uh, what about um, the impact of sanctions? It was uh, significant in uh, in the first uh, maybe two years of uh, sanction regime, because uh, uh, according to the assessments of uh, different economists, uh, uh, we can uh, measure this effect as one or even more percent of uh, GDP. <laughs> harmful uh, effect of uh, these uh, sanctions, but at the same time, really, uh, right now, the economy adapted to sanctions regime, uh, and it works in these uh, circumstances. It's not so good, but uh, at the same time, uh, it works. Uh, politically, sanctions uh, helped, uh, really, to consolidate uh, so-called Putin's majority, again, around, uh, around the autocrat. 
This is really so. There are some views uh, among uh, Western uh, analysts that sanctions stopped uh, this moment of Putin to the West, to Mariupol, or somewhere else. I can't assess, 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 assess it because I'm not a professional in this military issues, but uh, maybe this is so. Uh, right now, this is uh, impasse, absolute impasse, and everyone understands that sanctions are for a long time. Uh, what is concerning this um, meddling? Uh, I think that this is my personal opinion that Putin uh, didn't make any comment to his FSB officers or somebody else to begin this meddling campaign. Uh, maybe he allowed to do it. Maybe he agreed with some uh, actions uh, uh, which were initiated by secret services uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, he's an observer. He's a watcher. Uh, he's waiting, uh, um, I don't know, costs. He's waiting consequences. Uh, and uh, Yes, here is a result of, of it all. We have, in the end of the day, a so-called Russia gate. But at the same time, no one in Russia uh, assesses it as a, as a kind of a Russia gate. This is one more evidence of our mighty. If we meddle it into the American policy, okay, we are so strong that we can do it, and our hackers are the best in the world, as Putin. Yeah, yes, very, very effective, yes. If we didn't meddle, this is one more information attack from, from, from the West. We must defend our reputation. So, the, the first glance, this is contradictory position, but in the eyes of Russians, this is absolutely okay, and, and no contradictions at all. Something like that. Madam Ambassador, well, if I may, uh, since I uh, have a time just for a very short response. Uh, well, first of all, I would not uh, overplay the role of Russia in terms of success with uh, Korea and uh, Palestine. Russia really cannot do much. In terms of Iran, uh, Russia has contributed to that success, and now the U.S. is trying to dismantle this. So I really don't see Trump's road toward uh, Iranian success or success in Iran. But now responding to what uh, Andrei Kolesnikov said about uh, the um, fundamental uh, the solution of uh, the uh, uh, Western world uh, uh, through the parties and institutions. I'm asking whether it's really a dismantling or a crisis that will uh, really uh, rekindle a rebirth um, in the European Union. There's also a great change to renewal, either it will succeed or not. Ukraine is an interesting case where also in a post-Soviet uh, uh, dimension, uh, we are seeing also a move to renewal. I think uh, Ukraine requires another impetus uh, like uh, the Orange Revolution. I don't know what this impetus should be, but every now uh, they need to have this push forward when they get stuck. There is this move to renewal, but in the case of Russia, this is missing. Russia is sliding down uh, slowly into this black abyss. And this is the big difference, uh, the difference uh, without any sort of light in the tunnel. And um, the question, uh, to what extent uh, Ukraine uh, wishes to implement the Minsk Accords. Well, Minsk Accords had been concluded uh, with a gun to the head, and if it's uh, written or read literally, it's a, a count accord uh, to the benefit of Russia. The Ukrainians signed it not to implement it, but really to put a um, stop to the fire, uh, to ensure a ceasefire, without any intention to implement. First of all, because Russia is not observing its commitment, and in the post-Soviet area, contracts are simply not observed. And third of all, because the West also failed to observe its contract vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. And for the three reasons, uh, Ukraine was never even considering that anybody would expect them to observe uh, this uh, contract. And the contract implementable would be detrimental uh, because uh, for Ukraine because it would legitimize uh, the Russian or it will uh, get legitimacy to the uh, Russian influence, systemic influence at uh, the way decentralization is described and it would not ensure 
what theoretically is the objective of this contract, and that is um, uh, uh, sovereignty, integrity, and uh, of the Ukraine. And the par paradox uh, that we try not to see, but we are anchored in it, is suspending the sanctions, which are to defend uh, the European security and transatlantic security, but in, on a base of a contract that is not implementable. And in that implementation of that accord would be detrimental to that uh, uh, transatlantic security. Well, maybe it's the first time that I'm taking part in a discussion that is focused mainly on Ukrainian and Central European matters. And this is really an exercise that I carry out with my students. It's a virtual globe. I moved them my finger and I said, look what uh, the world is like if you live in Anchorage in Alaska, San Diego in um, US, or um, uh, Buenos Aires. So the world is quite different, and many people uh, not many people care about the Ukraine from um, the US. This is something that we perceive. This is a problem on our boundaries and our borders, and we see it. But in the US, more stated about I Iran, because it's also related to Israel, Israel and Syria. So it's much more in the public debate, the public discourse, than Ukraine is. Well, thank you very much for bringing us down to earth at the very end. I'd like to thank uh, you very much, Ekaterina Polczyńska-Nawent, Andrei Kolesnikov, and Richard Schnepp.